Hi all, while we're waiting for everyone to um, filter in, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the mechanics of the webinar. Um, for this webinar, we'll be answering questions in the uh, Q&A. So if you have a question uh, and you want to ask it, uh, I'd ask you to put it into that Q&A box and we'll either answer it in the Q&A or hopefully address it um, over the webinar itself. We also are holding about uh, 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for questions and discussions. So if you have questions or um, thoughts as we go through the webinar, if they're um, sort of short and topical, uh, you can throw them into the chat as we go, but also we'll be answering sort of larger substantive questions or discussion at the Q&A section at the end of the webinar. The webinar is also going to be recorded and um, Captions are available. If you need them, you should be able to turn them on uh, in the interface itself. So we're gonna wait one more minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Thank you all for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started so that we uh, can get everything done and have some time for questions at the end. Thank you for joining us for the webinar on creating culturally responsive materials with open educational resources beyond commercial publishing. Um, I'm not going to do formal introductions at the beginning of the webinar for the sake of time. I'm going to ask each speaker to briefly introduce themselves when they begin speaking, but um, uh, I want to broadly say this is hosted by the Project on Information Justice and Intellectual Property at American University in partnership with New America. And so to begin, I'm going to uh, pass this off to our colleague at New America, An Mei Zhang. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Thank you, Meredith. Um, it's uh, great to see you all um, on this webinar. And um, I want to thank um, Meredith and Luan actually for helping to pull together this webinar where I've already learned a tremendous amount just uh, in preparing for this with them. So I'm very grateful. So uh, my name is Ame Chung um, and I am uh, the Director of Teaching, Learning and Tech at New America. And uh, what is New America? So for those of you who may not know, it is uh, what they call a think and action tank. It was founded in 1999. And uh, it specifically was um, created to um, examine the intersection of technology and how that impacts public policy on issues such as national security, health, energy, education, and, and the economy. Next slide. So today, um, uh, I'm going to speak specifically about uh, the topic at hand, which is a project that is funded by the Hewlett Foundation on culturally responsive education and open educational resources, or OER, as many people refer it to. And uh, the uh, work that we do on this project focuses on building a research foundation and translating them into um, policy that's going to support equitable access to culturally and open instructional teaching and learning. We do this by convening roundtables and learning communities to network, share practices, identify any knowledge gaps, and um, bringing folks together to also um, uh, recommend solutions solutions as well. Uh, we partner a great deal with, um, with many, including um, uh, Creative Commons, to help us learn more about this, because this is really a research um, phase for us at this part of the project. We also identify and spotlight promising practices, and we do our best to produce resources to try and fill some of those knowledge gaps. Next slide. So two oh, did not show up. Interesting. Um, all right. So the um, the next um, what I'm going to talk about today is actually a research project that was um, uh, done by one of our um, research fellows who looked at over 160 studies on um, educational materials that range from not just text but also 
um, uh, videos and uh, digital materials as well about why it matters, um, what in terms of what you know students have access to. And this is part of, of, of addressing one of the eight competencies, number three in particular that we have. Um, another staff member a couple of years ago um, uh, you know, created and developed eight common competencies of culturally responsive educators that uh, some of you may have seen before that really produces um, a list of the competencies that educators consider when they're thinking about this. Next slide. So what does this study say? Uh, will be like, um, uh, you know, well, condense what is actually the issue brief that you all got into hopefully just a few slides to give you um, a picture of what that is. And so it begins with a concept um, uh, that was um, first brought into play by um, uh, Rudin Sims Bishops about windows and mirrors. And what are mirrors? Mirrors are those um, opportunities where students um, can see material that allows them to, um, um, uh, that reflects on their own daily experiences. Windows are an opportunity to look at the experiences of other students um, with cultures and other contexts. And that um, um, is a framing for um, how these materials are considered. So what do we, next slide. So what do we know about the social groups and understanding what that is? So the materials are what um, uh, Amanda, who was the researcher called the societal curriculum. It gives students the opportunity to learn about languages, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors and cross-cultural knowledge. It also helps students build identity when they have the opportunity to learn about the societal expectations of themselves um, and others too as well. Next slide. So when you do this well, and you have the right materials in place that allows students to see themselves as well as uh, and windows um, into other experiences, and you have um, you know, educators who have the skills and the materials to do this with, the research tells us that it actually um, enhances student engagement and improves academic achievement. It supports learning on a variety of subjects that students may have thought about before, and it influences career interests, particularly when they see um, themselves and, 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 and role models that potentially give them the notion that, oh, I can be X, Y, and Z because you know that person who looks like me and thinks like me or has aspirations like me, um, um, give me the opportunity to see that that's possible. Next slide. So how often are these social groups actually portrayed in materials? Next slide. So this table is sort of represents a little bit of what, um, uh, what if you compare um, a study uh, that was done on award-winning children's book with the census groups, you will see that there are um, some places where it's fully lacking, like in Latino X. It's like it's, you know, in the census, it says it's 18.7%. In the award-winning books, you only see representation 4.3 of the times. And you'll also see there's these large categories of unknown and multiple, which is almost 20% that has not been identified really in any way, shape or form. And what you don't see is, you know, some of the, um, the, the delineation of these different, you know, uh, other social groups that, that aren't necessarily represented um, in the census group. So it gives you an indication of, of you know, what um, work still needs to be done. Next slide. One of the areas that um, uh, I think um, has um, actually, we've seen a lot of growth in is the way um, females are represented. So over the years, as you can see from this graph, the uh, representation uh, the portray has, has actually increased in children's books. So it, it, that is a very positive thing. Other findings actually, you know, related to this suggest that the majority of main characters are still male and female, and you rarely see non-binary characters in any of the materials. Uh, when portrayals are um, uh, around females in partic or particular, you'll see that they still tend to be racially and ethnically white, and BIPOC characters are more likely to be male uh, than, than females or others. 
Next slide. So that was the frequency um, in terms of that, but how are these social groups actually portrayed in materials? So when Amanda looked at this and analyzed this, she um, was able to pull out some of the commonalities in her analysis across race and ethnic groups. And she found that there were narrow and pro uh, problematic portrayals. So oftentimes they might refer to just one region or one tribal group, and that would end up representing all tribal groups, for example. Uh, but she also found positive and promising de depictions as well. So um, across the board, they, uh, you know, she found that there were uses of language in the context of every, everyday society in terms of different languages. Um, there was wearing modern clothes, they were dealing with contemporary issues. So there were clearly um, positive and promising depictions. Um, on the other hand, um, there was also inaccurate and misleading um, or incomplete information there wasn't necessarily a mention of the historical nature of things. Um, and often customs and traditions and religions um, were um, uh, more stereotypical than, than not. Next slide. When you look at gender groups, um, what's clear is, you know, is that um, that still is the case, right? Is that um, um, uh, the gender groups in terms of women, the portrayals tend to be still more passive, dependent and stay at home, um, even though there are, you know, um, a lot of push for um, uh, scientists and careers that, um, that has yet to, to be realized. Um, there's lack of diverse gender groups and their contributions. And when you look at the intersectionality of things, it's just really limited in terms of how these different um, areas of gender and race and ethnic groups um, uh, um, uh, cross over. So even when you have characters that are and, and they're of diverse racial, ethnic, and gender groups, um, sometimes that sometimes the portrayals can be limited. They can be wrong. Um, and, um, and it often like um, will reinforce stereotypes and sometimes inaccurate. Next slide. So what are the takeaways? So the takeaways um, from this work that um, Amanda um, um, uh, came up with was like the tenth takeaway was that there are three different things that were important um, for um, about these materials and how they help you know, students um, create those windows and mirrors. One is the sense of belonging. So this idea of feeling like you belong, you know, to the community or the 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 place of where you live, and 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 how to create this this more well-rounded sense of belonging is just weaving a lot of the demographic subgroups into American history and curriculum, and and having it represented in educational materials. More of that to occur. Uh, the next one is having um, cultural authenticity, and by Focusing on this, if you choose and develop materials um, that are going to be more culturally authentic, you first need to examine the characters that um, are in existing materials, exist the characters that need to take, be there, the activities, but also the person who's creating um, the materials as well. You know, are they authentically able to represent complex depiction? And the last um, takeaway was um, being um, cognizant of the nuanced identity, like re recognizing that there's there are differences um, um, among subgroups, even um, and presenting the character details as, as, as such as names, clothing, and variations within group. And all these takeaways are important to provide those windows and mirrors that you know really support students in identifying, relating, connecting with not just um, you know a variety of careers and among themselves, but um, it really um, you know it does improve engagement and, and and academic improvement. So with that, I will stop and turn it back over to Meredith. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so having gotten that foundation of why it's valuable for there to be um, both broad representation in teaching materials, but also materials that are specifically authored for specific student populations, the question is, so if we think we need this different thing from teaching materials than what we are currently doing as the sort of main model, how do we move towards that change? Next slide, please. So one of the um, 
I guess, assertions or hypotheses that we're working with is that both currently traditional educational publishers are not meeting this need for culturally responsive teaching materials that sort of authentically reflect a different variety of student experiences, but also that the um, economics of the publishing model and the um, controls put in place by both copyright law and technological protection measures and restrictions mean that it's very unlikely going forward that publishers will deliver materials that are both um, nuanced and tailored to reflect lots of different student experiences and populations and flexible enough for educators in school districts to adapt them to the current local and changing needs of those students. So that our assertion is the publishers are not currently producing the materials that meet those um, goals that Anmay talked about then provide for those student successes, but that also in that system, it's very unlikely that they're able to sort of shift to that model, that they, um, because of the economies of scale of commercial publishing are going to sort of reduce to um, the sort of generic one size fits all sort of broadly marketable materials that really can't serve this purpose. And so because of that, we'll talk a little on the next slide about why open educational resources and the publishing and copyright tools that you need to make them can be one way for teachers who are already, or educators who are already putting a lot of effort into creating individualized resources can work within this ecosystem to create materials that are broadly shareable and that enable collaboration. So just to get us all on the same page, open educational resources are teaching materials that are released under an open copyright license, usually under the Creative Commons license, that makes those materials freely available to update, share, and redistribute. So when you create an OER, you're giving everyone in the public the ability to freely use and build on it by putting it under that CC license. And in practice, another important um, pillar of that OER practice is that you put those materials out in an editable format so that people who want to change them or update them or refine them for the students they're working with can do so. Next slide. And so if we take these sort of first two ideas that we need to have materials that are culturally responsive, that take into account and reflect specific student experiences and perspectives. And then the second thing is that a way to do that is in the process of creating and releasing these open educational resources that can be tailored and that can be um, specifically um, sort of made to fit for different student groups. But if you're going to create OER, you have to engage with three sort of big ideas in the copyright world in order to understand what allows you to make those and more importantly, share them with the public. Teachers have always spent time and energy making high quality materials for the classroom. But if you're planning on distributing those over the open internet, you need to have this copyright understanding of what you can and can't do there. Um, and so when you sit down to create those OERs, we encourage people to think that this is not a closed book test. You're not gonna sit down and write a lesson or an exercise or a textbook you know, in a room with a number two pencil in one of those blue exam books. You're going to have to draw on existing things out in the world. The first big bucket of existing things you're gonna to have to draw on is things in the public domain. And that can be things that have aged into the public domain so that are created in um, 1925 or earlier. The second and perhaps more important uh, group of things that are in the public domain are all the things that are not protected by copyright. So ideas are not protected by copyright. Their specific expression might be, but if you're sitting down to teach uh, about a historical event, something that happened, maybe uh, civil rights era events, protests, the dates and the facts and the information about those protests are not covered by copyright. So you might be reading another article or another book and want to pull that information in or even that perspective in the opinion. And those things are in the public domain. The ideas, the facts, all of that stuff is available to you when you're creating an OER. The second big bucket of things many OER creators turn to 
is other existing CC license material. And that's great. It's what it's there for. The people who created those materials put the Creative Commons license on them to say, you can use these for any purpose, including updating and revising them and making them fit to your own purposes. And so that's really important. Uh, there's a lot of great materials. They can be a really good place to sort of start and provide a framework for what you're creating. The flip side of the Creative Commons license materials is that they really exist in this tiny sliver of the entire copyrighted world. The Creative Commons licenses have only existed for about 20 years and they're obviously used by a small minority of authors. So the things you can do with these CC license materials are very powerful, but it applies to a, a small set of the existing copyrighted world. The third bucket is things that you can do under fair use and other limitations and exceptions to copyright. And so our project has spent a lot of time in the past two years talking to OER creators and authors and creating a code of best practices and fair use that lets people creating OER and uh, updating and revising it understand when and how fair use can let you pull in things from the existing world, uh, media or music or images or news articles that your students might have encountered and use parts of that for teaching purposes in your OER. Next slide, please. So thinking through what is the relationship between OER, this set of tools to publish open textbooks, open learning materials, fair use, this uh, limitation exception to copyright that lets you bring in things from the outside world, and this goal, with this the sort of pedagogical goal of creating culturally responsive materials. Next slide. We think there's a couple big areas where there's a sort of an interaction or an overlap. The first is that when you use, when you create open educational resources and you use them in the classroom, you have the legal and the technological ability to tailor those materials to the students in your classroom this year. You have the legal ability because they're under the Creative Commons license and you have the technical ability because they're released in editable formats. You also have the ability to broaden and increase who has the ability to author materials, who's in the eligible pool of people who can be teaching material authors. Um, and finally, there's this underlying thread that because OER are available for free, that you can reduce barriers and types of inequality that are based on cost. And then finally, fair use as a sort of cross-cutting tool allows you to address and critique and include existing cultural material in those open educational resources. So I'm going to turn this over now to my colleague, Will Cross, who's going to talk a little bit about the open part of um, open educational resources. Thanks, Will. Thank you so much, Meredith. Hey, everybody. I'm Will. My title is too long to try to list here, but quickly, I'm a lawyer and librarian who gets to help out with some of this stuff. And I'm, I think I'm here mainly to build on the good things that Anme and Meredith have said, in particular a sense that this, this sort of peanut butter and chocolate of open licenses and fair use can be brought together to make better materials that are sort of existing and, and static if remixable. But that combination can also be used to change and improve the way we use use those materials in the classroom and the way we invite others to work with us to collaboratively create and update those materials in different way. So the, the sort of shorthand for that process that's sometimes used is this idea of open pedagogy or open educational practices, the things you can do with open education and particularly with fair use as well. Uh, that, that idea of open pedagogy is sometimes described as an access oriented commitment to learner driven education. And I'll suggest that access oriented and learner driven are another way to talk about open licenses and the things you can do with fair use. We create new types of access with an open license and we enable people to do learner driven things, particularly with fair use, as Peter's going to talk about in just a moment. Um, so, for example, when we in, when we talk about having faculty select authentic materials to reflect different perspectives or to pull from the, the real world that they exist in. Uh, we do that by relying on exceptions like fair use to not just take a generic, invented, uh, not very interesting example, but to say last week in the newspaper there was an important story or, um, you know, this, this is something that got me into the field in the first place. Let me bring that material into the conversation as well. 
likewise, uh, this combination of open pedagogical practices gives students the opportunity to address their own lived experiences. Uh, when I get up in the morning, I listen to this song to get me going. Here's what the song sounds like in this context and so forth. So, so this opportunity for both faculty and students to bring their own experiences in the actual world is a, is a really important part of this conversation. And then the other piece of that, the access oriented piece, is that once we make those new things, the open license combined with those exceptions that Meredith mentioned become accessible uh, to the wider world and to the commons writ large uh, through what are sometimes called renewable assignments, assignments that aren't disposable, that aren't I say something and somebody says it back to me and then we write it down on a test and throw it in the trash, but instead an assignment where we create something that's meaningful in the wider world in some sense. So that set of things, the, the authentic materials, the lived experiences, and then the renewable assignments, that's what open pedagogy and open educational practices are all about, and that's what the open license and the exceptions like fair use let us do. And then the last thing I want to say sort of as an entree into the next section is to say that, that what Peter is going to talk about in a minute in terms of fair use uh, as, a, as an exception that aligns with our, our intuitions as creators, that, that a transformative use is a good pedagogical use, a transformative use is a good educational and instructional use, that centering of the, the agency and the expertise of instructors and students makes it a perfect fit for doing this work in ways that, that is not alienating or confusing or I don't understand all these weird legal nuances, but instead asks them to think about and do the good pedagogical things that they're trained to and excited to do in different ways. Um, so that's a long way of saying all the things that we've been talking about for creating open materials um, are going to help make us, are going to help enable us using those materials in really powerful ways as well. And on that note, I'm going to turn the mic back over um, and I'm excited to hear some more and then have a great conversation. Thanks, Will. And um, just before I pass it over to Peter, I would note that you know, when we look at Anne's introduction to this, one of the things that we, we heard was so powerful is students seeing themselves in the examples, in the cases, in the perspectives of the teaching, of the learning materials that they are engaged with. And one of the most sort of immediate ways to do that is to have roles for students to be co-authors, for have roles for materials to acknowledge student contributions over time, both for those individual students and so that they have materials that have been shaped by the students that came before them. And so this is one of the ways when we think about, you know, can you sort of do top down authorship of culturally responsive materials? The answer is maybe, but it's going to be hard to imagine ways that are more effective than having opportunities for student perspectives and experiences to also be incorporated and reflected in examples, in focus, and materials when possible. Um, on that note, I'm gonna go to the next slide and turn it over to my colleague, Peter Yazzi to talk a little bit about what fair use is and what big buckets of stuff you might be interested in accessing under fair use. Peter, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mary. I'm Peter Yazzi and I'm a retired copyright law professor who's worked with fair use and, and various practice communities over oh, almost 20 years now. So it's very exciting to be involved in this project with the, the OER community, which I've learned a lot about, and become very enthusiastic about. And, and some of my enthusiasm for the OER project stems from things that you've already heard on May and, and Meredith and Will say, and that is that in OER, it, it's, it's possible to incorporate a wide range of authentic materials that will supercharge the educational benefits of those materials by providing representation. And if I could have the next slide, I would just say that, that the, the benefits of bringing authentic materials into teaching settings generally and into OER in particular, as, as we've heard them described, are, are probably mainly two. One is that it's a way of, of representing the contemporary lived experience of students 
in the materials they learn from, including their cultural experience. The other is that it provides a, a way to give a comprehensive account of American history, especially 20th and 21st century history in ways that are inclusive rather than exclusive. Now, the problem is that all the good stuff that you might want to bring in to reflect students' daily experiences or to provide a comprehensive account of, of modern history are probably protected by copyright, probably not in the public domain, probably not subject to creative common licenses, which means that this fair use tool, which I'm going to be talking about, becomes very important. It's a venerable doctrine in American copyright law, going back to at least the 19th century. It's rooted in First Amendment values of freedom of expression. It's an open, flexible exception to copyright regulation, which means that it can and does apply in an extremely wide range of situations. Although it, it must be said that among those situations, everything around the practice of education represents a particular sweet spot. And last bullet, very important, especially if you haven't been following the recent history of fair use, the fair use doctrine has been changed dramatically by the courts, expanded and clarified over the last 25 years to become far more useful, far more predictable, far more robust than it previously was. Today, when we want to know whether bringing a, a, an image or a bit of video or some music or some text into our materials to accomplish the pedagogy of the purposes we've already been discussing, when we want to know whether that's legal or not, permissible or not, we ask these two questions. We say, is it a transformative use? Are you doing something with that material that it wasn't originally designed to do? It started its life as a news story, and now it's illustrating a proposition in an account of recent history. And then you ask, well, is the amount you're using justifiable, appropriate? And often, of course, especially pursuing my prior example for a moment, if what you're using is, say, an image, then the appropriate amount will actually turn out to be the whole thing. If it's a text, well, perhaps not. But these are judgments, and the document that we've worked on and have offered to the OER community, the Code of Best Practices and Fair Use, is designed to help people learn to make these judgments in a comfortable and confident way for themselves. Next slide, please. Why do we need fair use? Well, we've already talked about unlocking the world of copyrighted content for purposes of providing more inclusive representation. It also has the, it has the potential to enable us, and by us I mean educational, the right, people involved in various aspects of pedagogy, authors of materials and teachers alike, to talk about more different topics, because those topics can be, in effect, physically represented. And because it's the it's a doctrine that applies potentially to the whole world of copyrighted content, making it possible for, for us, the, the pedagogues, to choose what we are going to incorporate. We can avoid the potential viewpoint bias that may exist in the more limited range of creative common materials, just as classic commercial textbooks reflect viewpoint bias. So to some extent, although perhaps less pointedly, does this limited universe of material that people have offered for general use? Well, fair use is a right. You don't have to wait some, for someone to offer you material. 
to use it on a fair use basis. You are entitled to do so, and that makes a difference. Next slide, please. So what can, what can you get access to in, in order to incorporate in materials under fair use? Well, here are just a few examples. Things that are in institutional collections, which make them available to view or online, but may not be able or even willing to license them for educational use, special collections, local history collections, all sorts of 20th century archival material. This is an extraordinarily rich trove if what you're trying to do is to represent experience more authentically than has previously been the case. Popular culture and social media, popular culture and social media. The goal is to make it possible for students to recognize their own lives in the materials from which they study. This may be an essential element, again, because fair use is open and flexible, it applies potentially here as well. Current and historical news coverage of national events makes it possible to tell new stories about, or the availability of this news coverage makes it possible to tell new stories about recent history, stories that have not yet been told, and to do so in a way that relies on primary source material. And it, it's worth saying, I, it's been implied already by several of us, but I'll say it again. One of the great things about fair use as an open exception is that it potentially applies across all kinds of media and across all kinds of formats. Digital, analog, text, image, music, film, et cetera. So this is a, an incredibly powerful tool for creating culturally responsive OER materials, for achieving the learning goals that we have been talking about today. And we're delighted to be in a position to help others appreciate its power and take advantage of it. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, and so Peter has laid out sort of what fair use can enable, the ways in which you can take things from out in the sort of real world and bring them into the teaching resource and into the classroom. And often when we talk about that, we get questions that go, well, isn't it easier and just less complicated to link out to those things? You don't need to think about copyright then, just drop in the link and move on. Um, and to talk a little bit about why that's a problematic approach and why there's a lot of actual sort of hidden risk in that is uh, our colleague at American University, Prue Adler. Prue, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Meredith. Um, and just as way of background, I have been working on issues related to um, open access and OER for many years and ad doing advocacy work with Peter and the AU team. Um, on best practices for quite a long time. So I'm delighted to be able to be with you today. Um, and you know, as Peter mentioned, there is such great value in using copyrighted materials, both archival and more current materials relating to popular culture, social media, and more that relate to the daily experiences um, of the students and those around them. Um, but the failure, as Peter mentioned, of not relying on fair use and fair dealing in the case of Canada, due to concerns about copyright compliant, risks creating a much less valuable and less optimum appropriate OER and pedagogically less valuable. Um, it disadvantages students with disabilities, as you can see here, marginalized students and underrepresented voices. And we have learned um, through the adoption of the principles of universal design, all learners benefit from accessible resources. Now we have heard throughout the now almost two years of this project that there is widespread community support for 
accessible OER for all learners. And such access meets the mission of higher education and K-12, while at the same time addresses federal and state legal requirements. You know, as all of us know, many learners in very different settings are either undiagnosed or do not self-report. For example, the significant increase in students on different levels of the spectrum has become a challenge for all levels of education. And as a result, it is imperative that we need to ensure that OERs are accessible and that the appropriate inserts, copyrighted inserts, um, are used to make them more adaptable, effective, and flexible. And when I say adaptive, I mean that it's not just for the immediate use, but it's for all the downstream users and creators who can take it to meet the needs of their individual and community of learners. So that concerns about copyright compliance, as Peter mentioned and others, limit the effectiveness of OER and can slow down new projects by adopting pra practices, as Meredith mentioned, such as linking out. Uh, such practices pose particular risks and challenges to students with disabilities and those with other access barriers. So for some, linking out is seen as a key workaround and is generally perceived as a safer approach. Um, it can involve going to proprietary websites or social media platforms. And as we all know very well, um, links can change or break and linking out can lead students uh, of all, all learners actually to unintended directions. And so linking out in lieu of employing appropriate inserts based on fair use may result um, in inaccessible OER. And in that case, if a, a link resource is not accessible, the student has absolutely no recourse um, to make that accessible because she has no relationship with the original provider. Um, so for legal, moral, and mission-oriented reasons, making OER accessible to all students is met by reliance on fair use and fair dealing. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over um, and I look forward to questions and discussions for all of us. Thank you, Prue. Um, as Prue said, uh, I think it's really important to remember that you know when you're thinking about what's available to your students to make sure that you're not sort of dismissing linked out materials as supplemental materials and therefore subject to some lower level of sort of accessibility, that it's important that all materials, whether they're core teaching materials or supplemental materials are accessible to all of your students. And that it's really very hard to guarantee that if they aren't a part of the teaching resource itself, if instead they're a link out. The other thing Prue mentioned that I wanted to pick up on is I saw in the registration that we had um, a number of uh, colleagues from Canada who are joining us for this hour. And one of the things we wanted to emphasize is that while fair use law in the United States and fair dealing law in Canada are different in the sort of technical structure of the law, that we've worked with a Canadian expert, a legal law professor and legal expert in the process of reviewing and finalizing this best practices code that we uh, drafted to examine um, whether or not the things that were permitted by fair use are in fact also permitted by educational fair dealing in Canada. And one of the things we found is that they were. And so that um, uh, really without much exception, the things that are allowed under fair use in the US, the things that we talk about here in this, uh, talk about here in this presentation and talk about in the code are also permitted under fair dealing law in Canada. I'm gonna talk for a moment about um, what's next, about where we think we are and where we're going. And then we're gonna take uh, the remaining 10 minutes to answer some questions. So uh, very briefly on the next slide, we have four links. We'll send this out um, after the webinar, but also we'll uh, drop them into the chat. It's uh, the first one is a registration for our second session. We have a, a session scheduled, I believe on June 1st that's gonna do a little bit more of a deep dive on the sort of 
how to's of creating OER and specifically of using fair use to bring in uh, outside examples to create uh, teaching materials, to create um, materials with these sort of culturally relevant, or sorry, culturally res responsive teaching principles in mind. Um, the second is a link to the code of best practices, which is a deep dive in how fair use lets you bring outside stuff into uh, teaching materials. Uh, my colleagues, Bill drop, Will is dropping these into the chat right now. And um, then also the New America policy brief that we put in the chat earlier um, with the research that Anme discussed and a larger overview of that work on New America's website. So that's what's coming up. So we hope that we have to some extent convinced you of sort of three big ideas. One, that culturally responsive teaching is valuable and provides better outcomes and experiences for two, students. Two, that you're probably not gonna be able to buy it in off the shelf materials and that OER is a valuable tool for that. And three, that um, if you're gonna create OER with the goals of um, connecting with your students and of making materials that reflect their experience, you're probably gonna have to rely on fair use in at least some situations to do that. So we hope that you will stick with us and come to the second webinar to talk about some of the nuts and bolts of that. There's some questions in the chat. Um, I have some that I can answer, but I didn't know, Anne, it's been a while since you've had the mic. If you had anything you wanted to say, I could pass it to you. No, I, I, think, um, I think I'd like to hear from others and answer any questions that folks have that uh, I've learned, like I said, I've learned a lot already. Great. Well, the, um, the first question that's in the um, Q&A is, does the panel have any advice to people who are working in states where state government is actively working to ban educational materials that are representative of different cultural backgrounds. Um, and I'll open this up to others to speak about, but uh, a former colleague at New America, Sabia Prescott, had spent a lot of her um, time there working on these issues. And one of the things that, that she said that I always thought was very wise about that was one of the things about the flexibility within OER is that you can adapt the materials to be more representative in ways that you can um, that you can sort of get accepted in whatever context you're working. So uh, Sabia focused a lot of her work on um, LGBTQ inclusive teaching materials and was saying, you know, because of the politics that has been unfortunately sort of focused on that, that there isn't sort of one um, single sort of gold standard resource that could be accepted everywhere, but that you can figure out sort of what are the ways to sort of take the steps that are available to you in your political context to do what you can to teach the way you think you should. The other thing I would say is um, when Will was talking earlier about open pedagogy and the ways to engage students as authors and to give them space to talk about their experiences, that that's a really different thing than a sort of top-down um, curriculum ad adoption where you're saying, you know, these are the ideas about culture and politics and race that we're going to have as sort of a top-down adopted curriculum. And instead looking at ways where OER and open pedagogy um, can work together to allow students at a sort of more local and micro level to talk about their experience and the diversity of the things they think about, they've experienced, they've seen, they're interested in. Um, anyone else wanna answer that or add to that? I think the only other thing I would add to that, Meredith, is that there are also policy in place already about um, equitable um, access to education. So, um, and so what, um, you know, I've sort of learned from others who are, are doing this work is, is, you know, how do you reconcile that, right, in terms of that, but, 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 you know, focusing on, you know, that equitable access to materials um, seems to be one way that some, um, uh, some places are, are just using different terminology, like, you know, everyone wants their students to have equitable access to, 
to, to materials where um, they're engaged and where they're learning. And so that that's, that's you know, it, it's not perfect, but it certainly is an argument I think some um, states are making for um, ensuring that their students have access to these materials. Thank you. Um, you know, I think there was another question early on about, you know, when you were talking about the research about representation in materials and some of those was that research about representation in fiction, in storybooks, in picture books, or in textbooks. And one of the other things that we I think is important is, you know, there's a huge amount of political focus on um, questions about representation and race and culture and politics in these sort of explicit ways that it's being taught, but that it's also very important in a sort of depoliticized way to, to um, have the sort of everyday examples, uh, the examples in the math book, the examples about what biology you're teaching. Are you teaching about plants and ecosystems that are where you know, these students live? That there are lots of sort of, uh, sort of not political, but just sort of authentic ways in all types of teaching materials to reflect students' experience. And that that may be another way to sort of build materials that feel connected to students um, in environments that are more where like certain topics are hot button topics. You can still have just, you know, broadly, if you are working with your students to write their name, their own names and their own examples in your math textbook, that doesn't have to be a political engagement. Um, so uh, there was another question in the chat about um, what does it mean when we say to bring items in under fair use? And so we, had, we have done very many webinars about uh, using fair use and creating OER. And I think our time limit record for that is about 45 or 50 minutes. And so we didn't think we could do our 50 minute uh, fair use webinar within the context of this broader question about the relationship between culturally responsive teaching, OER and fair use. And so we hope if we have whetted your appetite for that, you'll come to the June 1st webinar. But in short, what we're talking about is inserting part or all of some existing copyrighted thing into for lack of a more concise word, the textbook. I know that in fact, what we are not talking about is textbooks. We're talking about slide decks and we're talking about exercises and we're talking about tests. But what we're saying is if your students, for example, um, are looking at the different ways that a protest has been covered in the media, how did we cover the civil rights protests when they happened? How do we cover them now? How did we cover the Black Lives Matter protests? How did we cover the January 6th march? How did you cover all of that? The ways those things are covered, you might take news clip it, snippets, you might take social media, and you might bring excerpts from those articles or pictures of headlines and put them into a, a resource. And when we say bringing in, we're saying that because we aren't talking about the whole universe of copyright and education. We're not saying, can you put this loose in an LMS? We're not saying, can you make 30 copies of it and pass it out on its own in a classroom? Those are important questions, but they're not the question we're answering here. We're talking about taking things, cutting precisely around the part that you are talking about in the teaching material, whether that is a digital or a literal cutting, and then putting it in there with context around it for your specific pedagogical purpose. So um, we are three minutes from time. I'm gonna look for any other questions in the chat. I'm gonna remind you all to um, register for the uh, June 1 webinar. We'll send you a follow-up link with the link to do that. And then I'll turn it over to uh, my colleagues for any last words. Well, on that note, I wanna thank you all very much for taking an hour of your afternoon. Hopefully it actually feels like spring where some of you live because in DC it's about 45 degrees. So we're still waiting on that. So have a great day and a great weekend. Thanks all. Thanks everyone.